not the one you bought that day we were with. Well, I guess that uh, we may not need any introduction today. We can cut this program a little short. I've been around shaking hands with everybody. If I'm introduced one more time, you're going to say goodbye. And I don't want you to do that. I want you to enjoy this day as I have. I've just uh, been down to visit with the uh, Southeast uh, Regional Group of the Building Trades. Had a very brief uh, meeting with them, but uh, we had a little something to say. You're busy. The time is short. I want to get to the matter of my, that's on my heart and some of the matters I'd like to discuss with you. I uh, surely don't want to travel under false colors. I'm not only here as a friend and one that likes to come to this great state of North Carolina to visit with old friends and new friends of the Tar Heel State, but I'm also here as a, as a candidate. I have uh, decided to uh, seek the Democratic nomination. You may have heard about that. <laughs> I think you might have a good reason to ask, well, why? What do you have to offer? Well, in 1968, we got started on the campaign late. We didn't have all the help that we could have used, and the candidate didn't do as good a job as he should have. We came mighty close. As a matter of fact, if you'll just review it, our Democratic Convention was the latest convention in the history of the Democratic Party. This year, our convention will meet in the middle of July, I believe July 12th. We opened our convention in Chicago, 1968, in the last week of August. It was time to a president's birthday, and a president that was later on decided not to run for re-election. It was not time to what are the actual needs of a candidate. It was not a president that was a non-incumbent. We didn't have time for holding hands, building organization, planning a campaign. We were sort of like the American Navy after Pearl Harbor. Hit. But the problem was we didn't break the enemy's code, as we were able to do in the Battle of Midway in 1942. That year of 1968 was one that we'll never forget. I hope in a way that we learn some lessons from it. <laughs> the tragic death of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The tragic death of Robert Kennedy. A president that decided late that he would not be a candidate. The bitter contest in the primaries. And then the unbelievable developments at the Chicago Convention. I felt after getting that nomination that I was like a person that had fallen to the bottom of the, of the Grand Canyon with no way to get out except to climb up the walls. No ropes, no help just climb up those walls. And that's about what I said to Mrs. Humphrey as we left Chicago. But we did have some help, and much of it's in this room. The help that I had in North Carolina is in this room. And you symbolize the help we had all across the nation, this liberal coalition. The word liberal isn't supposed to be very useful these days, but I think it has a meaning, and it's a good one. Not radical, not destructive, but constructive. It simply means that government is to be used for the people. That government has a role to play in enriching the lives of people. That government of the people and by the people and for the people is exactly what our government is all about, or should be. When I announced my candidacy, I was in Philadelphia. Why did I go there? <clears throat> because Philadelphia is the home of the Declaration of Independence, where the doctrine of natural rights and human equality was made a matter of American purpose. <clears throat> Philadelphia was the place where the Constitution was written. And those three great words that are the three words that open that Constitution, we the people. Today we take them for granted. When they were written, they were unbelievably new. Government by the consent of the governed 
as compared to government by divine right of kings. And it's still the same battle. Whether or not the government is going to be of the people and for the people and by the people or whether it's going to be for some kings appointed special privilege, people that want it just their way, that get a little extra for doing a little less. The struggle is still on. The battle against privilege, the battle against discrimination, the battle against bigotry, the battle against segregation. That fight started way back in this country in the birth of this republic. And this republic was established to see to it that we won that battle. And those of us who are in this party, and I hope in the other party, are committed by our citizenship and by our oath to the Constitution to try to do something about it. Now, I've been in government a long time. My whole purpose in government has been to serve. It's not a place where you necessarily live an easy life. What's happening here, but it'll work out. It's a, it's a challenge to anyone that's in it. Try to see what can be done to right old wrongs, to chart new courses, to open up new vistas, to really make these words, liberty and equality and fraternity and opportunity, real. This is where I started. I came in as a mayor of a city, corrupt, outmoded governmental structure, and rather than to document it, I just ask you to ask those who live there. And I spent two terms as mayor, revising that city's government, lifting that city to a higher standard of municipal performance and a better quality of life. The first human relations commission in the United States established in that city. We pioneered it. Oh, everybody's for civil rights today. You can't hardly find, you get some old reactionary. You say, well, I'm for that. But you and I know that those of us in this room had to fight it early when it wasn't popular. I remember only too well. I went on to become the United States Senator and Majority Whip of the Senate under John Kennedy's administration, and later on to become the Vice President of the United States. I think you ought to know that when a man seeks office, not only that he's outraged by injustice, but he does something about it. Not only that he is concerned over the inequities, but that he does something about it. Not only that he has good ideas, if he has ideas, but that he puts them into action. And my life in public service has been not only one of trying to be ahead of the times, but to fight to make ideas a reality. I was talking to a group of senior citizens yesterday in Miami. Everybody's for Social Security now. Everybody's for Medicare. But who was there when it really counted? when they called you a socialist, when they said they wanted to wreck the private medical profession. I introduced the first bill for Medicare. I introduced it on May 17, 1949, and fought for it for 15 years, and ended up being a co-sponsor of that legislation as the original sponsor, and being out in Independence, Missouri, and seeing that legislation signed in the presence of that beloved President Harry Truman. That's the kind of action that we need. I've heard people talk about that we ought to have federal aid to education. Well, I stand before you as one of the original authors of the National Defense Education Act, and one of the original authors of the federal aid to education. And when your students are going to college and they get a federal scholarship, I think you'll look back and see who was sponsored the federal scholarship program and got it as law. When I talked to those senior citizens, they told me they needed better housing, and they do. It was my privilege to be one of the authors of that, and indeed the prime author of what we call senior citizen housing. Many people talk peace. I can remember in 1956 when Adlai Stevenson went up and down this country telling us that we ought to have a test ban treaty on nuclear weapons testing to slow down this arms race to prevent the pollution of the air by the dangerous radioactive fallout. And boy, was he condemned, and there was one supporter. I was chairman of the Arms Control Committee of the Senate. I pushed that resolution through the Senate against great opposition. And we fought for that nuclear test ban treaty from 56 to 63. And 
I went to the Soviet Union as a representative of your government to be president of the, sign the signing ceremonies, and I was invited by the then President Kennedy to the White House when that treaty was signed, and when he signed it, he gave me the pen and said, Hubert, this is your treaty, because we worked for it. And whether it was the Job Corps for unemployed youth or the Arms Control Agency, which today is sponsoring the negotiations to slow down the arms race in Helsinki and Vienna, or whether it was Food for Peace or a food stamp program or Medicare or the National Defense Education Act or the Arts and Humanities Act, which today is such a blessing to so many of our universities and colleges, we had a hand in it. Now, I say that you've got to translate ideas into action. Now, why do I want this fellow out? that's in the White House. And I speak of him with respect for the presidency, but I speak of him, may I say, with opposition to his lack of leadership and concern and dedication to the needs of the people. There's a button going around here that some of you are wearing. Well, let me tell you, dear friends, let me tell you, we are paying one big price for his election. Let me say to the group that's in here, you working people, you members of organized labor, everything that goes wrong in this country today economically is your fault, not his. The cost of living goes up, it's your fault. All those millionaire workers, I just told the building trades in here, some people are almost led to believe that you were living in yachts and on the Riviera, <coughs> spending your time skiing in the Swiss Alps and living in penthouses on Park Avenue. Let me tell you something, you're lucky if you have a tent and two weeks vacation in a canoe in northern Minnesota. In the summertime, I might add, not the wintertime. <laughs> but it's your fault, according to the President of the United States, when the interest rates went at unprecedented heights, and young people all over America are burdened with those onerous rates on their 30-year mortgages, not a word came from the White House. It was the economy at work. A president that says to people on welfare, go to work, and there are no jobs. Scolds the Congress because we don't pass the law, and has told us only six months ago, don't do it. Talks about relieving the property tax on the cities, on the citizens in the cities and the countryside, and tells us to stop revenue sharing, can't afford it now, and proposes a tax not to revise the income tax laws of this country, not to close up loopholes that are inequities that are unconscionable. There are hundreds of people in this country that don't pay a dime of tax, and they're millionaires. Millionaires. <laughs> not one word comes from the White House on that. What they want to do is put on a value-added tax, a national sales tax on every one of you, which is inequitable which will rob localities of the right to raise some of their revenue, which will add to the cost of living. Here's a president, if you please, in an administration that has <coughs> refused to heed the needs of the people. Mr. Nixon says he has a silent majority. Why, he said yesterday the campuses are quiet. He says the cities are quiet. The majority is quiet. I wonder if he needs a hearing aid. <laughs> Let me tell you, there isn't a silent majority out here. There's a deaf administration. A president must hear the things that are not said. He must be able to look into the, into the eyes of the people of this nation and see their sorrow. He must be able to look at the young and see their hopes. He must be able to look at the sick and see their plight. He must be able to look at the needy and see their need. Some of them can't write letters. Some of them don't. They don't all riot. Most Americans try to make it the quiet way, but that doesn't mean that they're unconcerned. In fact, they're so, let me tell you why many of them are quiet today. They just know that nobody's listening. And I think my party has got to show people that we do listen, that we have an open mind, open hearts, open ears, and that we're open to the people. That's what I intend to do. I want to make government responsive to the people. I am tired of a government that can't see the need of child care and then at the same time demand that mothers go to work. I'm tired of a government that'll veto a bill to put library books in a library and say we can't afford books. 
I'm tired of a government, if you please, that doesn't think that we need adequate hospital care for our sick. 20% of all the hospital beds of this country today, hospital facilities are obsolete. Men coming back from Vietnam, 40% of the people going to a veteran's hospital turned away because there isn't medical care for them. Men coming back afflicted with drug abuse and narcotic addiction and very few clinics to take care of. And a president that can pretend that that doesn't exist, or if he does think it's existing, does very little about it. And I'm very tired of a government that can see people unemployed and know the needs of our communities and veto an accelerated public works program. Let me tell you, friends, if we could rebuild the cities of Europe, we can rebuild the cities of America. opportunity to serve. Not because it's easy. No man in his right mind can promise you that it'll come easy. But what this country needs is a sense of vision tomorrow. Not the yesterdays. Not to be content with what we have. Not to be angry. But to have commitment and put that commitment into action. I think we can do it. But you have to feel it. Something has to happen in this country. Government can't do it all. Leadership and government and private life must extend a kind of message of, of faith and confidence to the people, a trust not only in government, but a trust in each other and a trust in Almighty God. They really have to have it. And I think that from the highest office of this land, that's got to come. I hope to be able to provide it. Now, I know it's not easy. I want to tell you the first time I ran for mayor, I didn't win. The second time I did. The first time that I ran for vice president, sought the nomination, I didn't get it. The second time, I did. The first time I sought the nomination for president, I didn't get it. The second time, I did. Yay! Let me tell you, the first time that I ran for president, I didn't quite get it. And you draw your own conclusion. <laughs> real what I was talking about. We the people. Put yourself to the task. Don't let anything stand in your way. Don't let people say that North Carolina is not with the future. Of course you are. There is new leadership all across the length and breadth of this land. We need more of it. Thank you very much. Let me very briefly say, as I said before, it's the first home of the state AFL-CIO. I hope that 
we will grow bigger and better as the years go by. But this is your home, it's your building. I would like to at this time introduce to you the former president of the state AFL in North Carolina, Mr. T.A. Wilson, who's standing here, one of our old trade union leaders. Wilson, we're glad to have you. Mr. Chairman, Senator Humphrey, distinguished guests, and ladies and gentlemen, I assure you that I'm not going to take up any of your time today by a long, drawn-out speech, but I do want to extend to you my best wishes, and I hope that it won't be too many years before you'll have enough membership in North Carolina so that you'll have to buy two or three more buildings this big because this one will not be big enough to service the membership that I hope you'll have in the not too distant future. With that, thanks for the honor of invitation and the best of luck to all of you. Thank you. I called on the mayor pro Tim of Raleigh for a few moments ago before he got here. We left and drove his Cadillac over here and left him over at the hotel. So at this time, I'd like to recognize Curtis Lightner, the mayor pro Tim of Raleigh, to give you a few words of welcome. Thank you very much, Weber. We are very happy to have the opportunity to welcome all these very nice people and uh, dignitaries to our city. My favorite candidate, we are overwhelmed to have him with us. And we want to say a special word of commendation to Wilbur Harvey and all of his constituents who are endeavoring to do something about something that needs to be done something about. It does not thrill me to recognize the fact that as the greatest state in the nation, we are still 49th in salaries and income. Now, this is a serious indictment, and you know who it hits hardest. So I have a personal thing in this, uh, in this indictment. We're very happy to, on behalf of Mayor Bradshaw, who is fighting with the flu, trying to get out to the meeting tonight to say a few words to welcome you here. So he will not be here on this occasion. So I will welcome you in his stead and personally, too. Now, I'm real impressed with this building. And the fact that you have it next to a funeral home uh, serves notice that you better watch yourself. <laughs> now, we don't exactly need uh, a union in the funeral business because we don't go on track. Anytime you feel like you need our services, you can call. <laughs> Again, welcome. We're happy to have you, Senator. We're pleased to have all of the other dignitaries and good friends here. Thank you very much. Also, like Frank Leitner, a man that was late and not usually late, he's always here. Bill Holder, I thought I just saw him in the crowd. Is Bill out there? Bill, come forward. Bill Holder was the executive secretary of the CIO uh, Union, Industrial Union Council in North Carolina when there was a merger of the two groups and became the first secretary treasurer of the North Carolina AFL-CIO. And Bill, I'd like to recognize you for a few brief remarks. Robert, all I, all I, that I would like to say, and it's been a dream of mine since 1952-53 when this thing got started, and I'm just happy to see it here, and I'm very proud of it. Thank you.
I know it's one of the best friends we have. The, I think the, the Scott with the most backbone of any of them. Uh, State Senator Ref Scott Chen, I'd like to recognize Ref for a few brief remarks. Ref. Thank you, Wilbur. I appreciate this opportunity of being here. And uh, I'd like to say to Senator Humphrey that Miss Mary, Miss Carl Scott sent her kindest regards to you. It is a privilege to be here for this meeting. It's a good gathering, and I want to wish you lots of success. I see a lot of our friends in there, and I can't begin to recognize all of them out here today, and I hope you'll excuse me. Uh, we do have the mayor of Chapel Hill, who's on the committee here tonight. Howard, will you just hold up your hand if I let you come up here and speak all the candidates that won't speak. Reggie Hawkins is over here, and Senator Zell Bailey and Representative Liston Ramsey is out there, and uh, a few others that I'll probably miss. John Ingram, who's running for Commissioner of Insurance. Next one I want to introduce, where's John at? Hold your hand up, John. All right, come here. I want to introduce my family to you. My daughter, Susan, my wife, Jean, my son, Frankie, my son, Stevie, and my son, Mr. Papa, where's he at, buddy? Come on in. My son, Buddy Hobby, who became a father yesterday. And you building tradesmen, I want you to know he's a three-year apprentice in the plumber's union. My daughter's not here yet, is she? My daughter will be at the dinner tonight. She's not here tonight. All right, thank you. Before it does rain, Sam John Johnson from Wake County, where's Sam at? Oh, be Sam, Ham, hand Sam, you running and you got to be recognized. All right, before it does, Zeb yeah, Allen, Liston Ramsey, Evan Orange, you got friends up here that keep calling your name. <laughs> we got one candidate here today I am going to recognize, and I think all of you know who he is, and to me, he's the greatest candidate of all. He's been since 1948, and even before that time, that's just when I got active in 1948, a pillar of strength in the Democratic Party. He's also been not only a person with 100% voting rights for the working, voting record for the working people of this state and this nation, but he's been in the forefront of all the fights for all the things that labor stands for in this country. And nowhere, nowhere have we ever looked, no time when we were ever in need, that if we didn't want to to call upon this gentleman, and find him ready to lead the fight. He led the fight on minimum wages. He led the fight on better housing for low-income people. He introduced the first bill that became Medicare. He's been in the forefront of the Social Security fight. I don't have to tell you where he stood on Cal Parker and Landrum Griffin. You know as well as I do where he stood. And he's always stood there for you. I don't want to stand here and make his speech, but it gives me a great deal of pleasure at this time to introduce to you the best friend the labor movement ever had, the Honorable Senator Hubert A. Chumpley. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'll tell you, when Wilbur introduces you, you're introduced. <laughs> and I'm most grateful, I'm most grateful to Wilbur Hobby for this marvelous introduction. Before I forget it, I want to pay my respects to his wonderful family, his wife and his fine children, his young son that's a three-year apprentice. And I want you to know we need him. Uh, we need a good plumber. Whenever we can find one, we need all of you. And I surely want to pay my respects to Mr. Wilson and Mr. Barbie, ex-presidents, former presidents of the AFL and CIO. I just, you know, when I say former president, just kind of rings something in my ear. I don't know. I just... <laughs> now, these good men serve this labor movement faithfully and well, and just as Wilbur Hobby is serving this labor movement faithfully and well. And I also don't want to forget my Mr. Holder that's here that was 
with the CIO. <laughs> These uh, fine public officials that have gathered here and the many candidates. Oh my, we are all here together. And uh, I tell you, it's a good place to be. I'm not going to make any major address to you here. This is a dedication, not only of a building, but it's a dedication of a movement. That's really what it's all about. The AFL-CIO represents tremendous organized movement in this country of working people. It has many other associates and friends and other labor organizations. Let me just say to those that are not members of unions here, that no group has had to take as much abuse over such a prolonged period of time to gain recognition as the labor movement, unless it would be, may I say, some of our friends of the black community. And there's a great identity of interest, a great deal of suffering, a great deal of different difficulty, but a triumph. Like those beautiful words the labor movement always spoke of in terms of solidarity. The late Martin Luther King Jr. spoke of, we shall overcome. And both of them had the great American dream. This building represents a dedication to the well-being of the people of this state and this country. I've been in public life for some years. I started my public life in Minneapolis as the mayor of a city. And the people I had supporting me were just like you out here in front of me. The labor movement, that was my original support. I worked with the labor movement as a teacher in what we call workers' education. I joined and worked and helped organize the first local on our university campus of the American Federation of Te Teachers. I carry many honorary memberships. And I know that these buses out here, they ILGW people came in these buses. And I want to say that I carry an honorary membership now. My friends, my friends from the CWA, very proud of them. Many other friends, I have all across the length and breadth of this country. I was at a meeting the other day where my steelworker friends gave me an honorary membership. And by the way, I want uh, Mr. Hobby, your son, to know that I carry also an honorary membership in one of the locals in Chicago, the Plumbers Union. So you better be careful, young fellow. I'm watching you very carefully up there. So these are these mean so much to me because let me tell you why. The labor movement hasn't just fought for better wages and working conditions for its members, its members, as some people try to interpret it. There wouldn't be any Fair Labor Standards Act today, any minimum wage for the unorganized, were it not for the labor movement. The labor movement fought not only for pensions for its own members, but for Social Security. Who do you think put up the fight for federal aid education? Who do you think put up the fight for the war on poverty, the OEO community action programs? Who do you think put up the battle for low-income housing, public and private? Who stood faithfully by our country in the darkest days as we faced aggressors in that period prior to World War II, who understood the menace that faced us better than organized labor? Who is it that speaks up for health care for all of the American people today with a loud and convincing and persuasive voice, organized labor? Not, not just alone, I don't mean to make it exclusive. Our farm folks, the Farmers Union, the NFO, just to mention some, some of our farm cooperatives, our church people, the consul of churches and the different religious, Catholic, Protestant, and Jewish, and many of our academic leaders, our youth groups, and indeed many of our business people that are enlightened have fought this good fight. But, listen well to me, I've been in that Congress and I know who comes down there to battle, not just against Taft Hartley, not just against Landrum Griffin, which are, by the way, discriminatory laws, but I know who fought the, the fight for civil rights. I know who has been down there to fight the good fight for the things that the people need, the sick and the needy, the handicapped, the elderly, the youth. Organized labor. And it has been the conscience of this political, of our politics. And America is better because of it. 
Let me repeat that. America is better because there were men and women that joined unions and fought for what they believed was right. People live better today because men and women in organized labor insisted on a better wage and better working conditions. And all I suggest is that you organize more. Let's not rest on our laurels. There are millions of people unorganized. The state of North Carolina will be a better state and so will the state of Minnesota when more people enjoy better income, better working conditions. And I call upon the labor movement now to be the vanguard of social reform in this country. I call upon you to help the young people realize their goals. I call upon you to work harder than ever for the elderly who are today suffering because of low income and the high cost of living. I call upon you to rebuild our cities. I call upon you to speak for justice for our farmers. And I call upon you, may I say, to bind our country together. This nation needs a revival. Now, I'm not the minister here, and I don't try to take over those prerogatives. But this nation needs to be committed as never before to the cause of peace, to end a war and end it now. This nation needs to be committed to opening the doors of opportunity to every person. There is more talent in this country than you ever dreamed possible. It's not even being called upon. And I say to you that if we could learn to live with ancient enemies and enemies of World War II, and we have, we've learned how to live as friends and allies with the German and the Jap Japanese. The Germans and the Japanese, mighty enemies in World War II. <coughs> Today, our best friends, good friends, solid allies. Ladies and gentlemen, if we could reconcile our differences with them, and God bless them, I'm glad we have. Can't we reconcile our differences between each other? Can't we, as Americans, learn how to live together? <laughs> if we can preach democracy and peace the world over, can't we live in peace in America? May I just say to you as I conclude my remarks here, there's no peace in the world unless there's peace in your heart. There's no peace in this world unless there's peace in this city, unless there's peace in this country. And there'll be no peace and justice in the world unless we practice it. We can't export peace, and we can't export justice, and we can't export freedom unless we have a lot of it for ourselves. I think that's where we start. Let me compliment the builders, and that's what we are. We've got to be builders. I have an idea. Let's put America back to work. Let's get on with the job. Let's revive this country. Revive our spirit. Revive our economy. Revive our faith. Let's have a great revival for the American people. Thank you very much. Education, Pat Wingley, the Women's Activities Director, HRDI Director L.G. Holloman, his Secretary Hope Phillips, Secretary of Treasury State FLCR Roger Barbas, my Secretary Sandra Grady, and Robert Matthews here who's on the Appalachian Labor Council which works with our organization. This time we'll ask Senator Humphrey if he will cut the ribbon to officially dedicate our bill. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.